You guys know I do my best to answer all your questions about the Fisker Ocean, and we now know the range and have a good idea of the charge curve. So I thought I'd answer a few of your questions about how that good range will affect your road tripping ability with an in-depth look. There's some great noteworthy discussion in this comment thread. I wasn't impressed with the actual range of 441 kilometers, but if I read the auto-translated subtitles correctly, it was performed at Autobahn speeds of 120 to 140 kilometers per hour, which is way above North American highway speeds and normal range tests. Speed is definitely a factor in how much range you get, and real-world range will never be the same as any range determined by a government entity. Some other reasons why you may not get all of the range it says you should are traffic, cloud cover, tire pressure, wind, topography, cargo, climate control usage on the inside, and the climate outside, at least off the top of my head. Also, the max charging rate of 170 kilowatts isn't bad, but far from class leading for a non-entry-level EV. My EV6 does 230. 35 kilowatts. This is a great comment with a lot to unpack, but that's what I'm here for. I'm definitely taking the charging speed with a grain of salt. It's good that it will charge at 170, but this is evidence that it has the capability to do deep charges and stay close to 100 kilowatts. So the recent video revealing the ocean charge curve is really all good news. Fisker definitely made the right decision going with CATL, and that's the kicker. A Tesla will do 250, but it will only do 250 at a very low state of charge. Also, depending on what supercharger you're at, you may be splitting power, and that can also affect your charge speed. The next comment says, a simple update to the software can increase charging speed. I agree with all of the words in this comment except the word simple. Just like the UI and the software for the UI not being complete, software is not simple. I think we take it for granted these days, but software can only do so much. You're limited to the structural integrity and chemistry of the battery cell as well as the design of the battery module, the battery pack, and the battery pack's cooling system. I do agree that the software for the Fisker Ocean has plenty of room to improve when it comes to optimization, but I can't see more than a 5% increase in max charge speed and maybe a little bit of change to the curve just from software. However, there are exceptions to this rule. For example, if you start with really bad software, average software can make a big difference. That said, let's look at the next comment. Are you able to do 10 to 80% consistently under 20 minutes? Overall charging time matters most than a very short high max rate. The good news about the ocean is it does not have a short high max rate. It starts at a moderately high rate and stays at a moderately high rate for all of the important parts of its charging cycle. Here's Tesla's charge curve right beside Fisker's charge curve. I can't be 100% sure, and I know I'm putting a lot on this one charge that happened one time to the ocean, but the taper looks to be slower on the ocean, which is the best you can hope for. I think the charge curve and the charge time are different ways of saying the same thing. How long does it take to put this many kilowatts into this battery? The charge curve illustrates it, the charge time dictates it. But they're not the same thing if we're talking about different cars with different size batteries. Also, the EV6 may seem deceptively fast when it comes to 10 to 80% because 70% of the EV6's battery is 53.9 kilowatt hours. 70% of the Fisker Ocean's battery is 79 kilowatt hours. That 10 to 80% charge in the ocean is more than the EV6's complete battery pack capacity. So 10 to 80% can't be relied upon as a standalone metric. And I've actually talked about that in the past. Any technical spec with two numbers is too much. Hey, when's the next time we got to put gas in it? Oh, well, it goes 180 miles if I put gas in it for two minutes and 12 seconds. And then the last comment says, yes, the EV6 can do it when the battery is preconditioned. In the real world, a combination of range, charger availability, and charger speed will determine the length of time it takes you to travel somewhere. So let's go to the real world and compare the EV6 to the Fisker Ocean. And we'll throw my Tesla Model Y in there just to illustrate the difference between different cars and different charging infrastructure. The EGMP is the CCS king of road trips right now. Boy, that's a lot of letters. By EGMP, I mean the Hyundai battery platform. That's the EV6, the Ionic 5, the Ionic 6, and the upcoming Kia EV9. And this platform was designed on 800 volt architecture, which if taken advantage of, can provide a much faster charging experience. Remember volts times amps equals watts, and the 800 volt club is very
very small. Taycan, e-tron GT, the cars I just mentioned from Hyundai Kia, the Lucid, and the Hummer for now. And all of those vehicles can outrun the 400 volt competition, excluding the Hummer, of course. It needs 800 volt architecture just to charge in under two hours. Here's a really quick real world example of the EGMP platform at work. Don't worry, I'll explain everything I did later in another example. Let's travel across the country, Anaheim to Charlotte, and assume we're in a big hurry with three drivers. Basically, we're not going to stop except to charge. The first vehicle we test is Tesla. They have the superior charging network, which means in most cases, they will be the fastest. And Fisker Ocean aside, this test puts the eGMP platform up against the best charging network in America. 41 hours and 56 minutes in my Tesla Model Y long range. Let's do the eGMP, the Kia EV6. Just as suspected, the EV6 cuts off an hour from Anaheim to Charlotte. And this has been proven over and over again in different tests on different channels by different people. The eGMP is certainly the champ, unless you're talking about cars over $100,000. But CCS is not the king of charging standards. And range is important when it comes to moderate distance trips, or let's call them day trips, one day all the way. The Kia EV6 and Ionic 5 have a little bit of a limited range. They're less than 300 miles or right at 300 miles, which is plenty. But let's see how that affects a shorter trip. I live here in the eastern United States. Knowing this area very well, I also know it's not uncommon to want to take a trip from Charlotte, North Carolina to Pittsburgh, PA, or from Pittsburgh to Charlotte. The cities are almost exactly the same size and offer similar opportunities. Also, they're close by. They're within a day of each other and a great example for this type of trip. Let's see how a fast charging 800 volt eGMP platform really helps in this situation. This is the A Better Route Planner app and it's free to use. The first thing I'll do is input my start destination for the trip. As you can see, I've got the EV6 long range all wheel drive selected and we will charge it to 100% before we leave Pittsburgh. Also, to make the results more real world friendly, let's arrive at 25% using the fastest possible route. These are all selectable options in A Better Route Planner. And yes, if you're traveling the Eastern United States, EV owners need to do this before taking a trip to avoid being stranded, especially in a CCS vehicle. You'll see why when I hit go. The app is very cute before you hit go, showing me an as the crow flies style path. But as you'll see in a second, the EV6 will not be taking a direct path. This trip will take nine hours and 22 minutes in the EV6. Because the EV6 only has moderate range, driving through West Virginia becomes a challenge. So the fastest route starts with a drive due west, halfway to Columbus on I-70, followed by another charge to almost 100%. And even so, the EV6's second charge stop is a huge risk, as it requires a stop in Charleston, West Virginia for 36 minutes and will only add 39% to the battery. After that long, slow charge, it's smooth sailing, as the next stop is outside West Virginia at an Electrify America in Withville for 18 minutes. Then it's on to Charlotte. But let's look at that Charleston stop. And remember, this is the fastest possible way the EV6 can get from Pittsburgh to Charlotte. It's a charge point station with no live data, at least on a better route planner. It's not even labeled as operational. And if it is, maxes out at 62 kilowatts. Plug share doesn't even list it as a charger, but charge point might be able to help. Let's check it out. Okay, it is listed as available on the charge point app and they know what they've got. Check that price, $8 plus for 15 minutes, and we need to be there for twice that amount of time. But enough nitpicking. Let's look at how this trip shakes out on the supercharger network. Same destination, same starting point. I'll input my own vehicle, and for a closer range comparison, I'll only charge the Tesla to 90%. Same arrival percentage, 25%. Same trip criteria, quickest arrival. And in the Tesla, that crow will be flying right at our flank, as the trip is much more direct, only requiring 7 hours and 45 minutes. No westward jaunt needs no long slow charge in the middle at a dealership. In fact, one of these superchargers is brand new, just added in October of 22, making the longest charge on our route only 15 minutes. To compare the Ocean to the EV6, we need to be a little creative. Because the Ocean has such a long range, we have to find a vehicle that we can use to simulate the Ocean. The Lucid Air Grand Touring has 516 miles of range, but doing all the calculations and starting the trip at only 70%, which is the amount of range the Ocean would have at 
100%, a better route planner tries to charge back to 100% before entering West Virginia. So we need another example. Looks like a 2019 Model S is really close. And since the ocean has a similar charge curve, we're okay there too. Now I have to go in and adjust the criteria so a better route planner won't use Tesla superchargers on this trip. And after all that, a Fisker Ocean shaves off an hour from the EV6 with a 60 minute stop at a Harley Davidson dealership. Still risky, but it has been used recently and does appear to be functional. How do we break that all down? The Tesla was a one button and go and the fastest route. The EV6 needs to avoid West Virginia at all costs because the infrastructure is just simply inadequate for almost any CCS vehicle. And the Ocean actually overcomes this because of its long range, landing just over the Model Y in drive time. So, does the EV6 charge faster? Yes. Is the EGMP platform the CCS charging champion? Yes. Does fast charging beat long range? Most of the time, yes, but not always. Bringing me to another excellent comment. NACS, are you kidding me? There are 17,000 NACS connectors and 11,000 CCS connectors, which more or less relates to the number of EVs using them. Less than 1% of vehicles on the road are electric, and 65% of that 1% are Tesla, but that number's fading, and will continue to dilute as other multinational vendors move ahead with the open international CCS standard. I don't think the CCS standard is going to survive in the US. I don't think it will die, but it's not gonna matter. And that's why I asked Henrik for access to NACS in a recent video. Here's what we need, NACS. I know you're not the best buds with Elon, but if it makes you feel better, I doubt Elon personally designed that connector. And for a lot of your reservation holders, the Fisker Ocean will be their first EV, and they're gonna be real confused when they pull up to that Tesla charger and their car won't work. Have you thought about that? The way things are going, you're probably gonna have to do it anyway. And just really quick to throw it in, when I'm talking about CCS in this video, I'm talking about the one on the right the inferior one that only North America and South Korea has to deal with. The CCS plug that the rest of the world uses is great. So rest of the world, hello, I love you. Thanks for watching. This doesn't apply to you directly. Ford will offer an adapter next year and then go native to NACS in 2025. GM is the exact same. An adapter will appear with a native adoption of NACS in 2025. On top of that, Mercedes, Nissan, Polestar, Rivian, and probably others are switching to NACS as native hardware. Volvo is also switching, but hasn't really confirmed whether or not the NACS connector will be native, but they will offer compatibility. On top of that, Electrify America, ChargePoint, and SAE are also going to the NACS connector. And I like that little tidbit there about the engineering name, the J3400. Oh, and EVgo. What does all this mean? CCS may continue to be offered at charging stops, but the pipeline has already burst. This is a fact sheet from the Biden-Harris administration announcing that the Society of Automotive Engineers will standardize NACS so anyone who wants to use it can use it. Let's not forget that several states like Texas and Washington referenced here are going to require both CCS and NACS connectors be available at federally funded charging stations, which makes the CCS connector officially the new Chatamo, or as my commenter pointed out, the beta tape. You drive along, you pull up to a charger. On the end, there's one stall that has a weird connector. And now the weird one on the end is going to have two and probably look like this in the future. But the weird one now is the Chatamo. Ask Nissan why they still use it and I'm sure they would provide a totally incoherent, completely baseless excuse. But Chatamo is dead. When Nissan discontinues the Leaf, there won't be any more Chatamo in North America. And when Ford and Rivian and Polestar and GM all go native with NACS hardware. Charging stations will only provide the minimum CCS requirements. Will that be one stall? Will it be two? All I know is the other four or six or eight will be NACS. And for the proof, we go to the free market because the cables on CCS hardware are almost prohibitively expensive. They are a big failure point and part of the reason why the CCS network has so much downtime. And this problem does not exist with NACS. The free market and the consumer will abandon CCS because it's clunky, it's heavier, and it's more expensive to install, regardless of government regulation. What advantage does Fisker have by not offering some kind of NACS compatibility? 
either through an adapter or a switch to the native hardware. It's just another gigantic disadvantage that Fisker would have to overcome. And I feel like they have enough. There's no tax credit going forward in the US. They haven't built a service infrastructure yet. They have a long way to go on the software. And we all know the beta machine had much better quality. You just couldn't get any movies. And that's my kind of deep dive on charging and charging infrastructure and Fisker's range and its effects for now. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I try to answer all of your comments. For a quick breakdown of the software on the Fisker Ocean other than charging, check this one out. And I'll answer all your recent questions from my recent videos, and that'll be here when it's done. Subscribe for more. See you next time. Hey, smash the like button. Thank you.